John, we've known each other a long time. Yes. And I can tell you, I don't think I've ever seen you have more fun in acting. Did I misread something? It seems like you were having a blast up there. Well, it's, uh, it's all encompassing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it's nice when we only have to do one show. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, because you can, then you can really let it you know, out there. It's like Jason says, it's like the, you let out the entire. Yeah, you, you let the whole creature out, haven't you? Uh, yeah. That's so, what Norman says to Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I just think, you know, it's, it's rare that you have an encounter with uh, a great writer that's not diluted. And right. I've done a lot of adaptations, movies, and it's always diluted. And my goal was not to dilute uh, Philip Roth. Uh, we knew each other. We were going to do Portnoy's Complaint as a one-man show 30 years ago. He, he asked me. I worked with him. We didn't do it for whatever reasons. And uh, Did we you have a lot of connections. You had the I, right. I didn't have the rights to this. This was th th we were going to do that, and then we kind of bonded. So over. he died, and he didn't know you were going to do this. No, no, no. We were talking about various different things, and then Andrew Wiley, when I went to his memorial service, said, "Let's have lunch." And he said, "Did you ever read uh, Sabbath's Theater?" And I said, "You know, that's one of the books I haven't read." And I read it, and I said, "What about it? we do it as a, a play?" Wow, yeah. fascinating. I didn't know that. I knew that you were friends with. Uh, with Roth. Um, yeah. But Sabbath Theater is an unusual choice, right? Now, well, Sabbath Theater. So. Right. <laughs> well, first of all, there were eight movies made of uh, Roth novels. Yeah, I've never watched one, one was in French. Right. Deception, right. I think, is in right, French. Right, right. All of them were largely failures. Right. Well, because, as Philip said, the bar was so low. <laughs> uh, 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 I mean, he didn't, he didn't see a lot of them. A couple of them he did. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's hard to adapt him without having his, his framing device of what, what the characters think. There's a lot of dialogue in this, but there's also what, you know, what the author's voice is and his sensibility. So all we really changed, besides editing it, was first person, third person, and stuff. But th that's not Philip Roth. I did the plot against America, right. and you could tell when it was Philip Roth mm -hmm. and when it was someone else, even a good writer. He's not Philip Roth. You know what I mean? And, and I think it's really hard. I've worked with Primo Levi, the Bakoff, Echo, and in movies, and sometimes they don't have the dialogue. Roth writes great dialogue. That's such a really good point. Jason, I'm going to get to you Go, in a yeah. second, but... Jason, you talk. Uh, when he said <laughs> Primo Levi, there's a movie that you might not have seen, uh, but I wrote about it for the New York Times decades ago when he made it, called The Truth, in which he plays Primo's, it was shot, where was it shot, in Poland? It was shot in the Ukraine. In Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's about Primo Levi, the Holocaust survivor memoirist who is best known in America for the book's uh, uh, survival of an Auschwitz and a number of other series of memoirs. The second one was called in Europe, The Truce. In the, America, in the United States, it was called The Reawakening. Mm -hmm. And this was an extraordinary undertaking. John Turturro plays in it, the Italian chemist who was in Auschwitz for nearly a year and survived and figured out, at some point, tried to regain his life and return to Turin. If you want to see a great performance, see John in The Truce. Thanks. Another um, great performance. Uh, Another Turturro great performance. It is. It's a, so many. It's a really great one. So, Jason, you're a Jewish boy. So that's what I've been told? Yeah. <laughs> that's what they said at my bar mitzvah, actually. <laughs> yes. This is, uh, this is as transgressive as it gets. You know, this is a new line on your CV that, <laughs> that you should be proud of, right? That you oh, yeah. played multiple parts. In Sabbath Theater. Sure. Do you actually, I don't know how much of Roth that you know, but it's true. There was either people who loved him and loved everything about him, and there were people that were just ashamed of him and found him abhorrent. Right. Uh, right. Where are you? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which day are we talking about? Uh, no, I, I think I was always intrigued. I think, at, you know, at every Jewish boy's bar mitzvah, you have to learn to do a Woody Allen impression. And, <laughs> and sneak a copy of, uh, of uh, Portnoy. Um, 
No, I think I, I'd known some. I'd known Portnoy, and I'd known a couple of other. Uh, uh, well, that's spooky. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's. I think Mickey's mother is out there. Somewhere. That's right. Wow, <laughs> he's good. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, I, I read a few, and uh, but not this one. And uh, I think I was thrilled when John asked me to be part of this. But I didn't read the book until I did a few readings without having read the book. And then I read the book when we started working on this, and uh, oh, it's delicious. And I, I think that, of course, it's it's uh, transgressive, but it's transgressive in such a um, thank you. You know, he, he's hilariously transgressive in this book, especially. A lot of the stuff just makes you laugh at. A lot of the stuff that we had to cut so people didn't go running from the theater uh, <laughs> disgusted. What were the most the funniest parts of the book? And and I don't think any of it is not doesn't come from a character, you know, it doesn't come right. from a character choice. Yeah. There's nothing that's, that's excessive or just, or, um, uh, you know, unnecessary from a character point of view. So I loved it. I was, I don't think I was ever not a fan of what he was doing. John, I must say though, it, the book is funny, but you really made it funny. I mean, you really deliver Roth right. And I think the audience should know if you haven't read Sabbath Theater and you're now among the people who like to hear audiobooks, right. John Turturro is the voice of Sabbath Theater. I did it this summer, yeah. 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 Knowing yeah. that this was in the... Yeah, I thought it would be a good preparation and uh, it was very hard to do and there's brilliant sequences in it that, you know, we don't, we don't have. We only have, you know, two hours or, you know. Uh, but the framework of it, the love story, does frame the book. And, and that was what attracted me. I thought, you know, it's funny, and it's about death, it's about love, it's about sex, it's about failure, and it's very hard to find something that has that kind of balance uh, for, you know, people of a certain age that have lived a certain amount. And, you know, of course, as I was doing it, people were passing away even more, and I was, I knew what he was talking about, but now I know a little bit more about that, and uh, it really... It really resonates for me. It's very personal for me. I, I feel there are lots of people I knew or I've known that were like Mickey. Right. And you're brilliant people, but they just couldn't put it all together. You know right. what I mean? And uh, uh, essentially, what Norman says. Right. Right. What, about right. his buddy. You that's live right. in the failure of this civilization. Yeah. I think that's that's very accurate. But I, I want to go back to the, the, the filthiness of the, the thing again. And yeah, let's do that. I want to go back to it. Is everybody okay with that? <laughs> I they think stayed. That, <laughs> I think that, that John is able to... Uh, John himself, just in, as you were saying with the comedy of it, John knows how to play comedy, and it's really fun to play comedy with John on stage. And he knows how to make those things that might feel unpalatable uh, palatable. And uh, But on top of that, you know, he... He breaks your heart in a way with some of that transgressive stuff. I don't think anybody, when I first saw, did the reading of this, it was John and originally it was Marissa Tomei was in the first reading. And that last scene with Drenka, oh. what they're talking about, and yet it's one of the most intimate portrayals of a relationship. And it's so moving, it breaks your heart. And you, you're listening to what they're talking about and he makes it... It, the way that he can combine that, I think, is kind of genius. And unfortunately, Beth's not here. I would have talked to her about this. Because I have to say, um, I, well, I've read the novel. Right. And so I have a real good memory of it. And I'm telling you, there were lines that I remember that I didn't laugh at until you said them. Right. Which I think is a real credit to you. Well, you have to get underneath it. Yeah. You have to really kind of get under. The more human it is. And sometimes, it's funny. You do something, and it doesn't come doesn't get a laugh or whatever, and then you realize, well, maybe let me try it a different way. You know what I mean? And but I think mostly is if if it's full, and he's a robust writer. You yeah. know what I mean? He's also can be very tender. But two of his favorite scenes that he had ever written in any of his books was the fish scene, and the and the pissing scene. Right. He said those two scenes he would hold up as wow, uh, two of the best things he he'd ever written. And the Drenka at morphine at the end. Right. I, I agree with Jason. I thought, I remember reading it and not feeling, and this is something for those of you who love theater, that is what theater can do that even a novel can't do. Right. Because well, I wasn't, I never, I never pictured it that way. I, right. The way it's you... It's much longer. It's, it's much, much it's longer. way longer. Yeah, Fish we, is much longer, too. Yeah. 
Yep. Fish is much longer, but you crush that, Jason. <laughs> that you just Thank you. Still, Thank you. That's a beautiful you can. You were born to play an old Jewish man. <laughs> I've got years left on my resume. This is great news. Boy, imagine how good he's going to be 40 no, years. It's, it's great because when you look at Jason and he says, I'm 100 years old, and, you know, you're doing it, but, like, you really believe, like, you know, I, I believe that he's 100 years old. I'm like, wow, he's really, you know. And, so. and, and in the novel, and again, it's longer, but it, you pick up that it's the... It's it's a such a redeeming scene for Mickey. It is. It's you see him in a way that you don't really see him before. That's he's right. not mocking. He's not gross. Right. He's not lecherous. He didn't ask. Uh, he didn't ask fish. Let me see your penis. Right. Uh, you know. He just said, "Are you dating?" Right. right. <laughs> that there's a feeling. There's. You know. He just. That's all he wants to know. He does. And I thought that there was a tenderness, as if. Um, he returns to the home. scene. He right. returns home. He's he returns the boy. to the scene of the right. where the departure, right. where he's unleashed as this indecent right. puppeteer. Right. What what about a couple things? What about the idea? What about the puppeteer? Well, I think it's a metaphor. He 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 does finger puppets. He does other kinds of puppets, but he's like a puppeteer in life. He creates, you know, people. He brings them, you know, he's a director. So he's always, you know, acting and, and hiding at the same time. And he said, when that goes, then, then I'll really go. You know, I, I won't have that anymore. So I think it's a big metaphor, even though there is, you know, sections where he talks about that. But he also talks about theater a lot because he, directed, he directs like King Lear, a, a terrible production where he plays King Lear. Right. Uh, 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 so... You know, there were these people who ran theaters when New York was cheaper. No, you you you, you know, know this, right? You know, they when ran I moved theaters. to New York in the '80s to yeah. be a Wall Street lawyer, I just don't tell people that. I'm now a novelist. That's what I do. Uh, but uh, I, does anyone remember when there was off off Broadway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that Thank the you. tickets were eight bucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that yeah. was incredible. Of yeah. course, there was no internet and there was no right. cable TV. Right. And that was that era. Yeah, and I, that's, I mean, I was exposed to a lot of those people, and sometimes you'd see some good productions, and sometimes they would be really bad. You know? There so. was a lot of talk, Joe, uh, Joe Bonney, the director, there was a lot of discussion about early on about uh, Mabu Mines and um, uh, Living Theater, Group, Living Theater yeah. La Mama. It was like there was a lot of discussion about the off And Broadway the word scene. experimental. Right. Right, that yeah. that always preceded the, many of those theater. Ex That's right. Experimental. Right. Mama, you which see. makes a lot of sense for Mickey Sabbath because right. everything about it would have been, huh? Right. Right. You know, a filthy puppeteer. Right. Right. I also think what's interesting is that Mickey Sabbath is asocial. You know, he loves women and loves sex, but he's not political, <laughs> you know, or diplomatic. And it does seem something about the puppeteer, right? right that he he, he stops reading the New York Times. He hasn't yeah. read the New York yeah. Times in thirty he years. Does, yeah, and he and, and Norman he, they have a whole scene about it. Yeah, and then and then and Norman, it's a funny thing. He said, "Well, can you know where you live? You know, can you get a bagel?" Yeah, and, you know, and, and he goes, "Well, it used to be a bagel-free zone, but, yeah. but now, now it's not anymore." You know what I mean? And, uh, yep. it's really funny, you know. Thing. So I also think it's about, and it's a reminder of something. Um, it's about New York. Well, well New right? Jersey. It's not, yeah, New, New Jersey. Yeah. But New York and New Jersey, that, right. that, yeah. the, that first wave of Jewish immigrants. Right, right. And there There's a robust kind of quality to that that's, and you know, it's a little different. The patter, the braininess. That's right. Right, the connection to art and culture. Right. And actually, one of the things, I just get into this briefly and then come out, because you never know, this can go the wrong direction. Uh, but, you know, we're living in a time of renewed anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And in the 1960s, rabbis said, Roth is responsible for more anti-Semitism. Yeah. I actually think this is proof that that's not the problem. It wasn't Roth, right? If it's no. resurfaced, it's not because of reading no. Roth no, 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 no. I think this is something that is somewhat vindicating. The second thing is that <clears throat> this is now the counterculture, what we saw tonight. Yeah, that's right. This was counterculture That's right. on many levels. That's yeah. right. You all know what I'm talking about, <clears throat> right? 
we have a lot of people that come to the show who said to us, we don't see theater like this in New York anymore. Yeah. This doesn't exist in New York. I don't well, know if you have the experience. Well, but. also, it's the, the, the pattern, <clears throat> the sound that it makes, the braininess, the cerebralness. Yeah. And to, I hope this comes out right, it's about white guys. And you know the great the books of the great white men. I didn't you, you didn't hear this, but Saul Bellow's son is here. Oh, okay. yeah. So I'm saying this really is to when I saw it. I, I wrote about this actually. I didn't say this, but I should have said this is a Valentine to that era of 1950s, 1960s, 1970 New York. Well, I think you know the human animal is the human animal. You know, and a great writer like Saul Bellow or, and Philip Roth, you know. Sometimes they hit it, and you know it, it can be very specific, but there's a universality to it right. at the same time through this specificity. Yeah, you know? yeah, I'm I'm not sure I connect with the, the show about white men today. That would be the case if the book was written today. I think so, but my sense of you know of Roth as a second generation uh, Jewish uh, American. Uh, which he considered, you know, I think he considered himself a great American novelist rather than a great Jewish American novelist. That's another thing rabbis didn't like. That, well, there you go. He didn't he pulled himself out too far in, too far out. Um, <laughs> but I think that there's something about the fact that this was, they were not quite in it. You know what I mean? That's it wasn't, right. Jews weren't quite there. Yet. Now I think there's very much a connection between Judaism and, and white, being white, and it was there, but not as strongly. There was still an ostrac, there was still an ostracization, if you were. And, uh, yeah, especially if you look at the characters of like, in the book, it's fascinating because when he goes to Fish's house, it's a completely different neighborhood right. now. It's a black right. neighborhood. Right. It's right. much right. more uh, right. black exactly. neighborhood. Exactly. Good point. So there is a yeah. lot of uh, talk about immigration and race and how things have changed. And that way remember, too. this comes up in a lot of Roth novels at the end. You know, it's funny people know him for Portnoy's complaint, but oh, he no. doesn't really get going in my opinion, until the ghostwriter on. So, yeah. I mean, again, that's a min perhaps a minority view. But at the end, he goes on a tear. And you know what he's on a tear about? And this picks it up nicely. Aging. Yeah. In fact, some of the reviews I was remembering were complaining that Roth was going too fast. He was publishing novels too fast at the end of his life. Well, this I was his kind of breakthrough book because he was very depressed. He got uh, he was addicted to painkillers because of his back. With Claire Bloom, he, and with Claire, with him he yet? was going through. He was he went Did going you through guys divorce. Know he was married to Claire Bloom. Yeah, he went through and a lived terrible. Lived in England in London. Terrible yeah. divorce. So this book, he kind of came out of it. He was almost su suicidal because he was in so much pain, and this is the book that he had his breakthrough in the '60s. It was. This book, and then the direct opposite is American Pastoral, Human Stain, I Married a Communist. Those four books he wrote in his 60s. Right. And this was his book, actually was his favorite book, uh, writing it, he said, of all the books. But he didn't really care when he wrote this book. And what, what is in the book is a sense of freedom, of like, this is it. I'm going to let it all out. And it's kind of exhausting and sometimes but it's miraculous of because american pastoral is very stately it's composed in a different way beautiful book but the swede is the exact opposite right of mickey well he couldn't have written a swede without mickey yeah you good know point. so uh does everyone know what john is saying yeah, that? The, the, i can't recommend the movie but there is one no 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 <laughs> it's not don't, good don't see the, don't movie. See the movie read the it's book it's not but but the american pastoral by the way john if you remember an american pastoral he goes back to Newark. Yeah. And so it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Now it's all African American. Right, right. What happened to my father's store? Right. I think in that book, his father's a podiatrist. Right. You know, where's my father's podiatry right. practice? So that's what I mean about a sort of like a, an era that is very long gone, that is almost hard to remember. And that this, that's what I thought was so counterculture about this culture, right. right? That this play harkens back to a very different time of ur urban New yeah. York life. It does, but at the same time, it does encompass the big questions of life. It, it, more that, importantly, that it you, does, yeah. That you, go, that you come up against. And that's what I, I didn't want to do a period piece. I just thought there was something very relevant and resonant to me about it. But he doesn't kill himself. No, right? so he's, he, it's, right? it's invigorating. Yeah, no, it's right, I mean, it's a very, yeah. 
It's an ambivalent ending. Well, he's like right. he's got a, he's got things to do. He's got people to bother. And, you know? <laughs> it's the most Jewish last yeah. line of any book. And it's one of those great. It's you you watched one of the great lookbacks at the audience of all time, where you think yeah, he's going to kill himself, and he turns around looking essentially at you and Morty's things and go, "But who's going to take care of Morty's things, right?" Right. There's something really Jewish about that. Sure. I couldn't leave. Who will pick that up? Right. You know, well, there's a lot of question marks <laughs> yeah. in the book, you know, so there you go, you know? Yep. So, John, what is it? I, uh, what <laughs> I, I know, I, I know what, this question is going. Yeah. What is it with you and Jewish stuff? <laughs> I mean, why well, are you so good at it that, you, you know, I mean, there, there are people that are like, Argh! Why does Totoro always, I remember Barton Fink. Well, you do it so well. Is well, it because you're New York it, Italian? It, no, I, I grew up in a neighborhood, you know, was like Jewish and black. You know, some Italians, not that many Italians. My mother grew up, you know, in, in, in Williamsburg. She actually spoke Yiddish, uh, not fluently, but she could speak Yiddish. By the she way, there were neighbors. people who say the same thing. Yeah. I, we, I, we had Mario Cuomo on the stage once, right. and he said he could speak Yiddish. Right. And Colin Powell could speak Yiddish. Right. So that, and, and Sonia Sotomayor right. <laughs> can well, put, speak some Yiddish. Well, I think it was the Cohen brothers who started it. Yeah. They, they, they started it, and then other people saw that, and then Philip Roth saw me do something. He wanted me to do that. I don't know. Maybe I have something in touch with Philip's generation. You know what I mean? I don't know, but I don't think it's very far. I mean, my wife is Jewish. You know, I have kids. It's there, not, you, it's you, not you, foreign at all to me. Wait, to me. A, there's a Hanukkah book, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I, I did a, yeah, a whole Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah. There's a Hanukkah book. Yeah, yeah. You can buy it for Hanukkah. Family, yeah. But so <laughs> it's, to me, you know, uh, it, it's something that's very uh, close to me. The, and, the, and, Jewish, and, and just, the, the yeah. Jewish and the Italian immigrant experience is not, in New York is not terribly different. Right. Yeah, so, so, and because they were on, we were all on top of one another, you know. My, I, I didn't grow up in New York, but my dad was from... East New York and Brooklyn, and right. and, uh, right. and you know we just ran into uh, he he met Tony Danza recently, and they grew up a couple blocks from one another, and they were talking about the same things, the same accent. They could have both been Italian, they could have both been Jewish. Yeah. No one would have known. So I think that there's something about being the next generation down from that that we can carry that. John, you know, he's more Jewish than I am most of the time. <laughs> when you said you knew this was coming, can you tell me what you thought? I was, was no, I going to I, I was I gonna like do the Primo Levy thing? Well, no, because it was, it's just, I mean, a big part of my life, you know, influence literature-wise, it's from Jewish writers. Right. That's a huge part of my life. And I, I would say, you know, Primo Levi and, and Philip and Philip Roth actually helped me when I was working on the Primo Levi thing, and Roth's writing, you know. Uh, I mean, I like you know. There's a lot of you know w wonderful writers that I've been affected that are Jewish. N Natalia Ginsberg, I, right, I, I love right. you know. I love I read a lot of Italian right. uh, uh, Jewish writers who were related to uh, you know Pavese. I don't think was Jewish, uh, uh, but uh, so to me, it's you know everyone's an individual. So yeah. a, a, we're all individuals. You can't blanket any of us, you know. And so if someone asks me to do it and they're, they're the person, I'm like, okay, well, that must mean something. So, <laughs> and so, okay, I'll take a stab at it. What about that Mickey, John Turturro, has one big job here to be in every single scene and to d truly take over, dominate every scene. And you and Beth... Right, you have to play multiple characters. Yep. Have you ever done that before? Sure. You've done that. Yeah, I, I, I think the character I played most of my life is called Various. <laughs> 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 on any script. Many times You're not for Various John. now. No. Many times for John. No, honestly, it's uh, I, I. This is kind of what character actors do, and it's. Uh, I'm not sure Beth. Uh, does it very often, and I, I think she felt like, wow, are they sure they got the right person? But clearly they did. Um, she's phenomenal. Uh, but I love playing lots of different characters, and the fact that I get to go off stage and come back on and reinvent is, is really fun to say, okay, I'm playing fish. What, is, what does it mean to be 100 years old? We all have aches and pains. What is that times 50? You know, it's like, what does that mean, and how does that change your, how you hear and how your fingers move? And, 
And, and that's the fun part. But so. the Norman scenes are so whacked out, right? I mean, those are just, unlike in the novel they are, and on stage, the fact that Mickey could show up for one day and wreak such havoc, <laughs> you know, in their lives so with perfect. underwear and, ex and sh exposing himself and just looking for nude photos and finding new f nude photos. And I think there is just something about that scene, the scenes of Mickey, as if to say there, he's there essentially for a funeral. Well, he, they do go to the funeral right. together, yeah. right? You know? but and they're, they're, they're very critical of the of the rabbi, right? 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 <laughs> in, in the bar. They're like, "Oh no, here it yeah. is. which is the most <laughs> Jewish thing ever. You yeah. got to be critical of the rabbi. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. part yeah. of the deal." Yeah. yeah. But I, I remember in the novel, I thought it, and it, I feel it's very true in the stage version, that it's also an example. No matter what Mickey says, he chooses life. Oh yeah, right. No matter yeah. what he says, for you to don't listen to him. Yeah, that in many ways yeah. he is all in. His yeah. chips are all in. It may yeah. not be the way his mother wanted it, you know, yeah. a profession, right. you know, but he's all in. Right. And so the last scene picks up on that, and so does the whole scavenging around that house. Well, well even like Norman, I mean, he's a, he's actually a great. He's a real true mensch. You know, he he really cares about him. Even after everything he does, he says we, we got to help this guy. Right. He doesn't, you know, after exposing himself yeah. to his wife, yeah. you would think, yeah, we're not concerned anymore. <laughs> uh, I think the p novel and the play for sure is really also about loss. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, it's something that is a universal idea, and I think people turn to novels and plays for this, yeah. how to respond to loss. And it's interesting when you think about when Roth started this, because, you know, he was getting older, and he, right. remember, he had a lot of physical problems, yeah. you know, on top of everything. Yeah. This so, book is dedicated to two of his friends who died kind of young. Yeah, yeah, he had a lot of physical problems, and he, yes, and even in American Pastoral, which starts with the reunion, right. it's all about reuniting with the old Newark of his days, Week right. Wake High right. School, That's right. you know, that whole world. But what I thought was very poignant about this is that in each instance, Mickey loses someone, yeah. and he basically, yeah. you know, at the end is acknowledging that. Well, you know, to say, I'm the last one. I need to get a burial spot because there's right. nobody else. That's right. I'm going home for that. That's right. And I'm going to use this flag in a really interesting way. Yeah, I mean, this it really resonates with me. You know, it really it does, and I think it could would resonate for, with anyone of a of a certain. Experience well. Also, we all know. I can't again. I can't see you, uh, but you know, theater. Theater is oftentimes supported by people a little slightly older, uh, and and so I also thought sitting there, I right. thought, yeah, this is exactly the right audience. Right. But you there's know? young people who like the the, the script, yeah. uh, the, the play too. It's, it's very interesting. But a lot of resonance. I I actually uh, I think it's about just not just loss but grief, and. What I, we always we spent a lot of time talking. I don't know if John was part of the conversation, but I kept saying people are going to ask, "What's this play about?" I have no idea what to tell them. Uh, you know, I think Ari Levy, the, the other adapter of the book, uh, said she just I just tell people sex and death. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. that's great. That's a bit of a cop out for me. I got to be able to say, "What is this play about?" And I always I think it's about a guy who has started grieving at a very young age, and in order to escape it, just embraced debauchery and antisocial behavior to say, fuck you to life, fuck you to taking people away from me, and that was the only way he could cover it up, and now all the ghosts are coming home to roost. Right. So that's what it means to me, and I think, you know, uh, a lot of Beth's characters are the ghosts that are coming right. back, and a lot of my characters are the, the, we always, we say this a lot, when we in the rehearsal, we figured out a lot of, the roles that Beth plays are kind of in the past or dead, and right. a lot of the roles that I, all, all the roles that I play are in the present. In the I love present. that you said antisocial. That was right. more of what I meant earlier when I said that he would need puppets because right. his relationships were not, you know, he's not working on those. Puppets no. aren't gonna uh, no. die either. Right. I can't, I can't think of said. a more transgressive scene <laughs> on theater or in the novel than the cemetery scene where the two former lovers are ejaculating on the grave on the floor. No, I think, 
And the best part of that scene, really, is when John says, Mickey says, the chutzpah. <laughs> I love that. To me, that's the money shot. That's a great line. Because, <laughs> you know, you, he's just, there's nothing you can say at this point. Yeah, well, except like, for one thing. Yeah, like, I can do it, but he can't. You know <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. The chutzpah. And yeah. this scene was dialed back from the book. So right. yeah. go enjoy the book. Yeah. Uh, no, the book yeah. is, I know it sounds crazy. It's raunchier. Yeah. Way yeah. raunchier. Yeah. You keep saying to yourself, you know, and again, it won the National Book Award, right? And yeah. got mixed reviews the whole country. Michiko Kakutani in the New York Times literally said I was throwing it against the wall. Like, I, yeah, and then, and then the National Book Review guy, he loved it. So it was yeah. like they were they were battling. Yeah, people but really yeah. they but went to but war. It's grow, over. Yeah, but it's growing in its, uh, I guess, its reputation has. And I'll tell you, I think I'll tell you why I think that's possible. There's a lot of reasons, but I think we've lost our capacity to be shocked. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, as a people, right. right? You know that we've reached a point where nothing shocks us anymore. And this theater, this Mickey's Sabbath theater, the very nature of it, right, that it's designed to be experimental, mm -hmm. that it has enormous shock value, that I think people come to Mickey Sabbath in this production with much more sympathy than they do to the novel. I don't know if you felt that way, but I thought that the audience was rooting for him yeah. in a way, no matter what he's doing, you know, that the, we're rooting for Mickey, whatever the hell it is, and that, that we see in him not just humanity, but his own way of loving. Well, th that he's capable of doing it, I think, is kind of a miraculous. You know, uh, you, know you can't, you, Jason probably has his, uh, his own stories about this, but you can't get through a Roth novel without the mother. So we actually have... <laughs> I'm saying this, Jason, because you probably had a Jewish mother. This is true. Yeah, yeah. I still do. You probably still have a Jewish mother, and she probably haunts you. I don't know. In She's... the same way, because Roth started with that early. You yeah, know. but Roth, but Roth had a wonderful, yeah. really close relationship with his yeah, parents, which yeah. no one believed. Yeah, and I mean, you just read Patrimony, and you know that that really. Is a beautiful book about yeah. his dad. And I'd also, I, you know, I would always caution. My mother's actually great. Mom is doing great. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, uh, you know, this is, this is not a stereotype of a Jewish mother. This is, this is a mother who lost her son, her, her first oldest son, and, and basically died right then and lived for another couple of decades. Yeah. And, and, and it's about, about Mickey's loss of his mother at, 14, right. that's when she disappeared and everything changed. And what I love about the book, as well as this, even though the book is much more transgressive and Mickey is hard to root for at certain points because he can be really mean and, and uh, you know, this is how he behaves to everybody. Um, when you get to the last act of the book and the last act of the play with, with um, starting with A.B. Crawford in the cemetery, Grandma Fish, uh, everybody else up, up to the end, you you see you know why you get it you go oh i see i see why he has been this way this whole time and that scene with fish the most for me it's still powerful even though i'm not supposed to be hearing it you know he's saying or when on the train he says what if they were all alive mickey mama drank everybody yeah. alive yeah. At, at her house or if he's sitting here going if he can re just remember Mickey, Morty, Yetta, and Sam, then I knew it was real, and it happened. And yeah. uh, that really, still moves me to this yeah. day. No, yeah. and in fact, in the, you're right. The play does it, and the novel does it more. Yeah. The number of times that John is Mickey is almost, it's not an interrogation, but it's a deposition, you know, that yeah. he's really trying to get something out of him. And well, the most you, thing you that happens right. is that we existed. Right. That, that we it's existed. not just well, that in our imagination That's right. or puppeteering. That's that right. this family was normal at some point That's right. before the losses set in, yeah. before the damages set in. Right. And, and in the novel, if I don't remember, he, he not only taught him how to, he taught him to swim, and right? Fish. I'm trying, yeah. fish and the other guy and, and, and uh, Morty taught him how to, you know, how, how to fish. But no, they, no, fish taught them how to yeah, fish. No, fish used to take them out with a bunch of guys, with the, yeah. with the older yeah. guys. With the older guys. Yeah, with the older guys. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there is a, that's the moment in the play for me where you go, if you didn't get it, or end of the book, where you go, oh, okay, I, 
I totally get everything. I know why he behaves the way he does. I get the whole thing. He just has lost something, you know, this 50 years ago, he lost something and he's never been able to get it back and he, that's what he wants to find again. And that's so. why the next scene moves to the keepsakes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The box opens Which because Fish literally doesn't deliver what Mickey nope. really needs. You know, but boy, of yeah. course I remember you, Mickey. Yeah. Of course I remember Morty. He was the track star. Yeah. Right. And then you followed in his footsteps, right? And that yeah. Morty, at this point, Mickey's trying to just in any way hold on yeah. to some of that because yeah. he sees he's the last. Yeah. He's the end. And All right. Well, before we say goodnight to the audience, I, yeah. have, a, I have a one last question for the okay. both of you. Um, theater. Uh, You've done television, you've done movies, you've done, you've done, there's still, it's, and I suspect everyone wonders about, you know, the future of theater. You've come back, I've seen you do theater over the years at BAM. Mm -hmm. You keep coming back, you've done stuff. H how, first of all, do you, do you believe it will continue? Do you think that there's, I mean, I love this building. I like everything about what they did here. And I'm just, I've always worried about, you know, the survival of it and what it accomplishes that just isn't, uh, doesn't appear on Netflix and doesn't appear in films. What is it that you think this, why is this, Will this theater why are we here today? Why is this important? This, this, it's this whole thing. The show you saw today will never be repeated. The show that we did yesterday was different than the show we just did today. It was alive because of the response here and the, the, the connection that we have with you, the connection we have with each other, the connection, the, what we brought into this today. But I think that there is something, and this might be better for you guys to answer, um, but for me, theater will never go away. Live storytelling will always be more resonant in some ways or in a different way than things that are uh, manipulated by film and television. Um, I say that in the most loving way and I'd love to do more. Manipulated by <laughs> film and television. This is raw, this is here, and you're not gonna, you, you can only see it the one time. Will it survive in a financial way? I have no way of knowing that and it's very difficult to, uh, to say that in the current situation. I see a lot of theaters frittering away, mm -hmm. and I think it's a huge loss. But I think it'll always be a place for live storytelling. Well, I, think you that, uh, I think that, I, I think that, you know, it's, I love movies, I love t TV, but, you know, there's something closer to being in a synagogue or a church or a mosque, whatever. It's communal uh, interaction. You're here, we're here, we're doing it for you, we're telling you a story, and it's, to me, there's there's something kind of sacred about that ritual, and I, we don't like doing eight shows a week. We'd rather Sometimes. do seven, you know. Uh, but is this is, something, is it grueling? It's grueling. It, it's, this play it's is grueling, grueling for for John yeah, more yeah, than for me. Yeah. But but it, like today yeah. is one show, so I wanted to give everything I could, you know. Uh, but I, I I think there's something really beautiful about that, and it's humbling, and you can't hide. There's no, we're the editors, we're the composer, we keep the pace, you can't cut from shot to shot, we do it. And if you fall asleep, that's on us. You know what I mean? So our first job is to keep you awake, and then to entertain you, and then maybe take you somewhere. But when an audience is open-hearted, and like today, you, you feel like, I don't know, there's a beautiful thing about it, and you... It makes me feel like I'm part of a community, and I and it means a lot to me. Jason, I just want to say one more thing, uh, just about the the grueling nature of this. I just want to uh, point out that what you're seeing is the culmination of years of focus by this guy, who, I mean, taking a 350-page novel, 450, 400. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read past 350. I don't know what happens ever. <laughs> And then, and then getting it down to <laughs> yeah. 100 minutes that still tells the same story, the same love story. I know for John, because not only was he has dedicated to the Roth estate and to Philip himself, and dedicated to the theater and dedicated to the people he's going to be working with, uh, pu cutting certain things was like pulling fingernails for him. And yet, and it was difficult in a lot of ways and 
the dedication that he put into making this thing yeah. into what you saw tonight. I, I'm, I'm still in awe of he and Ari and Joe together. I should give them credit as well. But, uh, and then to get, and then after all that, after all that, to get on stage for 100 minutes and never leave, I think it's kind of impressive. So, uh, I'm a fan. And I, one more, one more observation, and we'll say goodnight to John and okay. Jason, which is, when John mentioned Andrew Wiley, who was Philip Roth's agent, his literary agent, he hit, right. to answer a part of what Jason said is, in addition to all the work that went into this, he gave this to you. He couldn't have just given it to me. He had to, he, he, he said, you actually had to leverage being John Turturro to commit yourself to this project. This yeah. thing, you know, I mean, something it might it's a little embarrassing, but it's true, right? I mean, yeah. if you don't bring in a name guy, and it just, it's interesting, to, when I thought about that, I mean, I don't know if this was a graveyard scene where Wiley says, no, come, no, to, come we, to my office, no, I got no, a project no, for No, we you. were talking about it for years to do something together. Because, yeah. you know, that's the other issue, I think, about Broadway and off-Broadway theater, that it, it is somewhat star dependent right. in a way that that wasn't always true. Right. And so I think that it is incredibly, not just as an artist, but generous of you to have given yourself to plays. But to me, it's a, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. That's He's a, a mensch. Great way to end. John Turturro, Jason Kravitz, Savage Theater.